Good evening and welcome to Horizonte. I'm here today to announce that the program known as DACA that was effectuated under the Obama administration is being rescinded. The Trump administration ends the DACA program that offers temporary deportation protection to immigrants brought to the U.S. illegally as children. We'll have analysis in a roundtable discussion. And find out where you can go to get information and resources for Latino families affected by a disability. All this coming up next on Horizonte. Horizonte is made possible by contributions from the friends of Arizona PBS, members of your PBS station. Thank you. Thank you for joining us. I'm Jose Cardenas. President Trump moved to end DACA, the program that protects the nearly 800,000 young undocumented immigrants known as DREAMers from being deported. The executive branch, through DACA, deliberately sought to achieve what the legislative branch specifically refused to authorize on multiple occasions. Such an open-ended circumvention of immigration laws was an unconstitutional exercise of authority by the executive branch. The effect of this unilateral executive amnesty, among other things, contributed to a surge of minors at the southern border that yielded terrible humanitarian consequences. It also denied jobs to hundreds of thousands of Americans by allowing those same illegal aliens to take those jobs. Our collective wisdom is that the policy is vulnerable to the same legal and constitutional challenges that the courts recognize with respect to the DAPA program. Joining me to talk about the announcement are Corina Iribe Romo with Undocumented Students for Education Equity, Roy Herrera with Louis Roca Rothgerber Christie, Sean Noble, partner with Compass Strategies, and Ayense Millan, managing attorney with SEMA Law Group. Ayensa, um, you're an immigration lawyer. Give us a quick overview of what actually was announced yesterday. Well, um, essentially what happened is that uh, DACA, which was a program that Obama uh, announced in uh, June 15th of 2012 that allowed certain uh, undocumented um, youth to be able to acquire uh, a work permit. Essentially, that's what it was. Um, they rescinded that uh, executive action uh, and what it did is essentially um, they delayed the full rescission of the program uh, and they gave a date of March 5th of 2018. Uh, what they said was that people that had not applied at this point would not be able to apply as of uh, yesterday or September 5th. Uh, they also have until October 5th of this year to be able to renew. If you do not fall within October 5th and March 5th, uh, you will not be able to renew your work permits. And it is our understanding from that announcement is that they will allow uh, these young um, students to be able to keep their work permits until they expire. One quick question. Uh, what about people who had DACA status? whatever reason allowed it to lapse, will they have an opportunity to renew it? Our understanding is that if they uh, currently do not have their uh, DACA, um, meaning their cart has already expired, they will not be able to renew it at this point. Roy, why yesterday? Why, what was the magic of September 5th? Well, the Trump administration was operating under an artificial deadline. Basically, a number of state attorney generals had written to the White House saying that they were going to bring a lawsuit on the same grounds that many of those same attorney generals brought against uh, the DAPA uh, program, which was successful uh, in federal court. They were going to bring a similar lawsuit against DACA. And they basically told the administration that if you didn't rescind the program by this particular date, uh, that they would bring the lawsuit. Now, what ends up happening, of course, is the Trump administration, including Attorney General Sessions, that didn't want to uh, defend this lawsuit in federal court. So, you know, in an effort, I think, to avoid some of the blame, they punted the issue and basically said, okay, we're creating this six month delay, and now Congress needs to do something about this and help these uh, dreamers. Though, so even if they had chosen ultimately not to defend, and as I understand, this is an existing lawsuit, and that what they would have done is move to amend. Maldef is a party there. Uh, Maldef would have opposed the motion to amend. Tom Sines did a column, the head of Maldef, pointing out there would have been months before the administration would have had to take a, 
a position. So, so why September 5th? Was, was it the politics of it, the excuse to be able to it, it take was, some action? It um, was, because again, you know, while the, those, that lawsuit was successful against DAPA, and by success, successful, it was successful at the Court of Appeals level and never went to the Supreme Court. So even if it was challenged under these, new, the DACA program was challenged under these same grounds, there would have been a long runway there in a lawsuit before we would have found out whether or not a court would find it uh, unconstitutional or not. So he didn't need to make this decision now. He made the decision now purely, in my view, for political reasons. And I think because of the strong negative reaction, uh, he has you know, essentially told Congress, do something about it. Uh, but again, this was his decision, and in my view, was one of the cruelest decisions that American president has ever done. Uh, because now all of these people, these hundreds of thousands of people, uh, have had their entire lives upended, and we don't know exactly whether Congress is actually going to do the work uh, to help them. So, Sean, uh, maybe you didn't have to make the decision now, but also couldn't you have made a different decision? And, and I don't mean to maintain DACA, but to say, look, um, uh, DACA is not going to go away right away. I'm going to work with Congress to, to get uh, the DREAM Act passed. And then if that doesn't work out, I may end DACA. Why, why not announce it that I, way? Because he got pretty strong backlash, almost universal. Sure. Well, I think he, he probably didn't expect that kind of backlash. I don't think he understood the issue personally as much. I mean, this was driven by Jeff Sessions, make no mistake about it. This is Jeff's, This is the top of Jeff Sessions' agenda, and it was him that was driving this. And the reports the are the president struggled with this. Well, I think he did because I think he was getting input from people close to him and friends who were in the business community that said, you know, wait a minute, this isn't necessarily a good thing because, I mean, despite what Jeff Sessions said about the uh, the jobs that are being taken by these uh, dreamers. I, I mean, we have the lowest unemployment rate we've had in, in years, and I'm not sure that they could actually point to places where, uh, we, I mean, we have a lot of jobs that need filling here in Arizona and other places. Um, I think what, what will happen ultimately is that Trump decided to do this because he was being told this is a campaign promise you made, even though he's not certain that he made that promise. Stephen Miller, who used to be a Jeff Sessions staffer in the Senate, is his policy advisor in the White House, and they think very much the same. And so Jeff Sessions and Stephen Miller are kind of a mind meld, and that was driving this agenda on this. And I think that ultimately what will happen is that Trump says, look, Congress, you've got to pass this. You've got to change something. I actually am pretty optimistic because... And I use today as an example, I mean, or this week when Trump decided to side with Chuck Schumer and Nancy Pelosi on the debt ceiling issue, and, uh, and threw Mitch, Mitch McConnell and Ryan, uh, Paul Ryan under the bus, I think he's now had a pivot point. I think this is something that some of us had kind of projected before he got elected. As he, he gets elected, he's going to not be a conservative Republican. He's going to be a deal maker. I think he's now demonstrating that. He's made a deal with this debt ceiling thing, and I think that that opens the door for a DREAM Act to actually come into place, despite the protestations of some of the more hard right part of the Republican Party in, in Congress. So, Corina, I know from discussions you and I have had, you're not as optimistic that the president will be able to or will want to, to uh, see the enactment of the DREAM Act. I want to get to that, but before I do, Tell us about the reaction of DREAMers to yesterday's announcement. Yeah, well, I myself have DACA. I applied for DACA in 2012 when the initial applications were uh, rolled out. And I think for us, especially here in Arizona, we've been conditioned to uh, these attacks. We, on the first day, were denied our driver's licenses, and we had to fight that legal battle and also advocacy battle we saw with our tuition rates which was also a legal and advocacy battle. So here in Arizona, we were in a different place. We were ready and organizing for this. However, when the decision came, it was still uh, very devastating for people like myself. Because not a surprise, though, I take it. Not a surprise, but still a letdown and devastating because this, we are real people. These are our lives that are at stake here, our homes that we've built, our jobs, our careers, and then the fear of being dragged away from our families. Uh, being at risk of deportation with the end of the DACA program, uh, with ending the, the protection of deportation. I've seen read reports that some people may just drop out of school because of this. Uh, have you heard anything like that? People being so discouraged, they're just ready to give up? Unfortunately, we don't have the capacity to reach every single dreamer. There are over 800,000 DACA youth across the country and 28,000 here in the state of Arizona. 
that means uh, we are exhausting all of our efforts to be able to reach these people and let them know that there is hope, that community organizations will fundraise and that we will provide the resources that we can so that they can continue to live their lives as normally as possible. But we will not reach every single person and that's what this decision does. It will destroy people's lives because they won't be able to find answers. They won't be able to find the resources. But there is hope. We are putting together a fund to help people renew their applications. To pay the fees that, that are associated fees, with if that. If they are eligible, we're also partnering uh, to help find scholarship money for students. And we're providing legal and um, emotional support for students. So we want them to know that we're here for them as a community. I work with Undocumented Students for Education Equity, and I'm on a table with many other community organizations. So let me ask you, Jens, one of the points that the Attorney General made was that President Obama's executive order was, quote unquote, vulnerable to legal challenge. Is that true? Well, um, if you look at history traditionally, we've had um, presidents that have used different forms of defer action to protect uh, and for the public interest or for the national interest to pr protect a certain section of the immigrant population. This is not something new. Uh, what Obama did is something that many other presidents uh, have been doing. You think it's defensible? Um, yeah, of course, e of course. Even in light of the decision that was reached with respect to DAPA? I mean, would you be able to distinguish between the two programs? Well, I think one, um, I think the difference is, is the amount of people that it was protecting. And the main argument was in, in how this would impact the states. Obviously, because we're talking about uh, dreamers are a fraction of the amount of undocumented. Which I think some people said DAPA would extend it to, to 5 million people or something like that. I, I believe it, yeah. was, it, it would have been a lot more than yeah. that. Because we, so yeah, let, let me ask you, Roy, um, if indeed, and, and it does seem to be, uh, or at least to hear the Attorney General say, the weight of, of uh, authority as expressed by legal analysts is that um, uh, DACA would have gone the way of DAPA. What's wrong with what the president did? I mean, we do have to, at some point, deal with the DREAM Act, either pass it after 17 years of trying or, or just give up. I mean, at some point, you do have to deal with it. Yeah, and I, you know, I, I wish that, I hope that Sean is correct uh, and that Congress is able to do it. I, I don't have that positive outlook simply because, again, we've been trying to pass the DREAM Act for a very long time, uh, comprehensive immigration reform for a very long time. I mean, I was on Capitol Hill when Obama had was president and we had democratic control of Congress and it still didn't get done. Um, and so I'm, I'm skeptical there, here. Because some of the blame, at least in the past, has put, been put on Democrats. Sure. Because who, who they, didn't want to just do piecemeal, as they put it, uh, immigration reform. Exactly. I mean, I think if you t uh, thought about the DREAM Act you know, uh, as a standalone measure, you'd get overwhelming support, but it gets wrapped into the larger comprehensive immigration reform. Uh, question, which includes enforcement, and that's why I think there's going to be a problem getting it passed this time around, because you're going to have some Republicans that say, essentially, well, we'll do the DREAM Act, uh, but we're going to have to tie it to enforcement and, and things like that, and so I think Sean, you're going to lose a lot of Democrats. So what happens if, if, if the Republicans insist on funding for the wall? Well, I think part there's of probably deal. chances that that will happen, that, that some Republicans will insist on that. However, I think that the, the, what's going to happen, the, the humanitarian aspect of this is what's going to be really, really important. What the things that Karina is doing and others that are putting the face to this, I don't, you know, Jeff Sessions and Stephen Miller, they don't personally ha see this in their life. Um, but the more that this is brought out, the more that this is talked about, the more that public policy uh, leaders are aware of this, I think that, you know, it, the Republican Party, is, as hard as it is for people to believe that right now, is really a party of compassion. Keep in mind, 1986, well, 1984, Ronald Reagan campaigned on his re-election on amnesty. I mean, that was his position. His, the, plank, the party plank was amnesty for illegal aliens, and that, that happened in 1986. I think we need to get to that point where we realize that we're in a humanitarian crisis. There's no way that we can expect these kids to go back to where they originated from, it's, it's a home they don't know. It's like sending, I grew up in Sholo, it's like saying, you can't go back to Arizona, you have to go to you know, New York City. I mean, and, just, and yet, consistently, people have said the president is, is pandering to his base in, in so many areas, and, I, and, and his base is 
expecting to fulfill this promise well, I think in the, DACA? I, I, would, I would venture to guess. I think this is what's going to happen when members of Congress go home during the breaks over the next few months as this, de this debate happens, is that the base doesn't really think about it. I mean, I don't think really grappled with the fact that we're talking about kids who don't know any other home, that this is their home, as much as it is my home. And to, to say, we're going to force you to go back to a place that you don't know, you don't have any connection to, you don't have any anybody there for you. I mean, I think when people stop and think about that, it's going to completely change the dynamic. Now, that means the comprehension, comprehensive reform is probably not going to happen. But I do believe that there will be a legislation that passes that protects dreamers because the the public will demand it. I think we've been demanding it for almost 20 years, and this sharing of narrative of who we are. We've been doing it. We do it every day, all of the time. And it's how we were able to win DACA. A lot of the a lot of the credit goes to the president and to the Democratic Party, but it was undocumented youth who risked themselves, put themselves to be arrested, to advocate, to put pressure on the president when he was campaigning for re-election, that pushed him to pass the DACA program. And I think for us, is we have no other option, whether I personally think this is gonna pass or not, I have no other choice than to push for it because it's my livelihood. And I think 800,000 DACA youth across the country will feel the same way because we have made the decision to so not. So Corina, what happens if we get to March 5th, 2018 and there's no Dream Act? I think for us, again, being pushed back into the shadows is not an option. It would be about continuing to organize and, to, and, and hold politicians accountable. You talk about our compassionate Republican Party when Attorney, Gen Attorney General Jeff Sessions came on yesterday talk, using the word compassion, uh, insinuating that we were terrorists and that we stole jobs and um, all of these other things that we are not. And, and I want to talk a little bit about that. Sean, you already addressed one of those things, the, the, the suggestion that because of DACA, jobs have been lost. And, seems inconsistent with with the job right now but but um, Roy what about the suggestion that that it's because of DACA that we've had a surge of um, sent miners from Central America crossing the border in the last two years is that a fair charge well I mean that's a charge that's been leveled a lot but I think the studies have had sort of mixed results on that and whether that's actually true or not but I think that also sort of gets away from the the central issue here about who is receiving DACA I mean for the most part these 800,000 uh, dreamers are uh, people with no criminal history. Uh, there are 90 plus percent of them have jobs. A lot of them are educated. They're actually, if we're looking at this from purely an economic standpoint, uh, a net positive for the economy. So they're contributors. Exactly. So they're let me ask taxes. one last question because we're almost out of time. Ayensa, um, some people have commented on the irony that the president, after this all went down uh, the other day, said, and if Congress doesn't take care of this, I'm going to revisit it, suggesting he will take executive action. Well, he's suggesting that it's legal. <laughs> so inconsistent. Yes. And on that note, we're going to end our, our discussion. <laughs> yes, it is. Simple. It is. Thank you so much for joining us on Horizonte to talk about it. And you are watching Horizonte on Arizona PBS. Coming up next, find out where you can go to get information and resources for Latino families affected by a disability.
The second annual Latino Disability Summit and Resource Fair offers resources and information for people with disabilities. Joining me to talk about this is Rebecca Cavazos, co-chair for the Latino Disability Summit and Resource Fair. Rebecca, welcome to Horizonte. Thank you uh, for having me. As I understand, you. this is the second year. Yes. Tell us how this whole, got, whole thing got started a, a year ago. Well, um, it was an initiative for uh, two people talking about how Latinos uh, get um, oh, I'm sorry. I have it, trouble with, with, with getting services. Yes. And, and you work for Ability360, Ability 360. 360. which focuses on helping people with, with disabilities. With disabilities. Yes. And as I understand it, they noticed that there, there, were, there weren't as many Latinos participating, in the, and the purpose of this was to deal with Yeah, that. in all the services we do, uh, it was a, a low participation of the Latino people. And um, the, we started uh, along with Chicanos por la Causa and AARP to make the first, um, this is the second year of doing So those are the partners, year. Chicanos por la yes, Causa, Chicanos AARP. Chicanos por la Causa and AARP. And, and Ability360. Yes. And so um, it, it, was there some analysis or do you have a good sense yourself as to why it is that, that Latinos haven't been um, participating more broadly in these kinds of programs? One of the main uh, reasons is the language, the language barriers and also cultural barriers. I think Latinos is a community that tend to protect the, their individual with disabilities and we want to change that. We want the people with disabilities know that they're, they can be independent, they can be uh, in the workforce and they can have relationships and go out and uh, practice sports. And on the cultural side of it, you often hear that, that part of the issue, if there is one, is that Latinos, it, it, the families take care of the people, yes, their own relatives. Yes, we are very protective. A, yeah. And so how do you deal with that? Is, are there Spanish language programs, for example, at the fair that are offered? Yes, we're, we're ready to receive people which uh, just speak Spanish, and um, we're going to be ready for them. So the, the materials talk about over 50... Um, presentations, workshops, and demonstrations. Oh, no, we're Give us a have sense for eight, what's going eight on. Workshops, uh, oh, it's 50 exhibitors. Yes. Yes. Over 50 exhibitors, uh, which offer resources and services for people with disabilities and their families. So give me an example of some of the exhibitors that people would see if they go. And, and by the way, this is on September 16th, September right? September 16th from 9 to 4 at Ability 360 Center, uh, which is in... Um, Mexican Independence Day. Mexican Independence Day. Yeah, we, it's a coincidence, but it's a good reason to to come and celebrate their own independence for people with disabilities. And so the exhibitors would include what? Chicanos por la causa, AARP, Ability 360, and many other organizations uh, from different government agencies and health uh, providers. And the materials talk about demonstrations. What, what kind of demonstrations are going to be offered? We're going to have demonstrations of uh, uh, how to transfer for the people with disability, how to transfer from their wheelchair to uh, different spaces. Uh, we're going to have free screenings, dental, uh, memory screenings. Um, we're going to have also uh, PBS accessible uh, kit zone. And, and I take it that some of the demonstrations really are targeted at families, how to care for loved ones who have disabilities? Well, those are the workshops. We're going to have eight uh, workshops. Some of them are um, dedicated to, uh, le to teach people how to get advocacy, um, health services, uh, their trust for special need trusts, and um, immigration, too. So uh, on the immigration side, what, uh, what are you talking about there? Do you think there are people who don't come forward to take advantage of the services because they have immigration issues? Or? Uh, we're going to have uh, w two workshops. One of them will be uh, get a plan for people with, which is uh, they can be been taking care for a family who may might be deported. They need to have a plan, and we're going to have uh, that workshop, and we're also going to be offering free immigration consultations. And how many people do you expect to attend? How many people did you have last year? Last year we have 400 and we expect to to have more this year. And, and how are you promoting it? What kinds of things? Spanish language radio, TV, what? Yes, TV, radio, social media. Um, and do you, did you find last year that most of the people who showed up were, were monolingual Spanish? They only spoke Spanish? 
Uh, no, we are, we also have a lot of people who just speak English too. So if people want more information, we put we put up uh, uh, the website information and, and phone numbers. Any anything else they should know? Uh, that an event is completely free and everyone is welcome to to join us. And September 16th. September 16th from 9 to 4. And, and we're at quickly. Ability 360. It's 5025 uh, East Washington Street. On Washington. Well, thank you so much for thank joining you us, for Rebecca, to t talk about this and good luck with the event. Thanks. And thank you for watching for Arizona PBS and Horizonte. I'm Jose Cárdenas. Have a good evening. Horizonte is made possible by contributions from the friends of Arizona PBS, members of your PBS station. Thank you.